My name is Twyla Tardif. I'm director of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for today's talk. Before we begin, um, we have a few announcements. Our next presentation will be next week, and that will be held on Tuesday, February 16th. It will be given by Sylvia Lintner, Associate Professor in U of M School of Information, who will be speaking on prototype nation, China, and the contested promise of innovation, which is based on her new book. In addition to help bring in the Lunar New Year, the CHOP film series will be showing the film Last Train Home tomorrow evening, and that's Wednesday, February 10th at 7 p.m. The film was directed by Li Xin Fan and puts a human face on travel during the Chinese New Year by focusing on one family of migrant workers as they journey back home. Mary Gallagher, director of the International Institute, will be the discussant for this important documentary film. Today's presentation will be given by Xue Fei Zhen, a professor of sociology and global urban studies at Michigan State University, as well as a center associate at U of M's Lieb Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. Dr. Ren's work focuses on urban development, governance, architecture, and the built environment in a global perspective. She is author of two award-winning books, Building Globalization, Transnational Architecture, Production in Urban China from University of Chicago Press, and a second book called Urban China from Polity Press in 2013. She's currently working on several comparative projects on urban redevelopment in China, India, Brazil, and the US, as well as culture-led revitalization in post-industrial cities such as Detroit, Karbin, and Turin. She's a recipient of a number of distinguished fellowships, including one from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, from the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies, and from the American Council of Learned Societies. Dr. Ren received her MA in Urban Planning from Tokyo Metropolitan University and her PhD in Sociology from the University of Chicago. Her talk today will be based on her new book, Governing the Urban in China and India, Land Grab, Slum Clearance, and the War on Air Pollution, published by Princeton University Press in 2020. Please welcome me in joining her. Thank you, Twyla, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity today to uh, talk about my new book. Um, the book took me a very long time to finish, almost 10 years, longer than my dissertation. Um, and in the middle of my research, uh, I remember I was invited at least twice by the China Center at the University of Michigan to present different chapters. So, um, so today I just want to say a big thank you to uh, the colleagues, my colleagues and friends at the China Center, University of Michigan. I really appreciate um, your support over uh, the process. And I'm also very happy that I finished the book before the pandemic, uh, uh, otherwise it would uh, take even longer. So today I'm going to share with you some of the findings from the book. Um, so let me start by uh, uh, giving you a very brief overview of the urban trajectories of China and India, the two countries I paired in the book. Um, so last year, in the year of 2020, more than 60% of China's population was urban. And for India, it's only 34%, according to uh, the Census Bureau in the two countries. So China is much more urbanized than India, at least according to the census. Um, but the comparison based on the census numbers can uh, be a little bit problematic because the two countries for many years <coughs> have, <coughs> excuse me, have used very different ways to uh, count the urban population. India, for example, for the last 60 years has been using the same and very strict, very narrow definition for counting uh, what is urban. And as a result, because of the way uh, the, the, um, the, the urban definition used by the Indian Census Bureau, 
the official urbanization rate in India is uh, quite low, only 34%. And some geographers working on India argue that um, if the country had used other alternative measures, then the actual urbanization rate would be somewhere between 40 and uh, even 55%. So the short story here is that China probably by all measures is much more urbanized than India, but the actual gap between the two countries is not as big as uh, what you see here on this um, um, a graph. Um, and second, in terms of um, uh, fact having urban population increase, there's also a number of differences, major differences between the two countries. For China, as everybody knows, the big story is migration, especially rural to urban migration. China has almost uh, close to 300 million migrants, and most of them are rural to urban migrants. So migration has been driving China's uh, urban population growth. And another mechanism is uh, this one, uh, reclassification of rural towns as municipalities. So the picture I'm showing you here is uh, one of my field work sites, uh, one of the places I studied for the book. It's uh, Lufeng city in the south, in, the, uh, in Guangdong province, in the Pearl River Delta. Until 1999, Lufeng was a county, rural county. And then in that year, 1999, Lufeng County was promoted as a municipality. So when that happens, uh, once a place changes its administrative status from rural to urban, then everybody living in the town was counted as urban for the next census. So across the country, there are many, many, probably more than 2,000 localities, which have uh, changed their administrative status from rural counties or townships to uh, municipalities. And some scholars argue that this single mechanism, which is basically manipulation of uh, the administrative status, accounts for about 15% of China's total urban population. So it's pretty significant. Um, for India, very surprisingly, migration is not a big factor. Uh, it's not the biggest factor driving India's urban population growth. And instead, it's in situ urbanization. So what it means is people are not moving away from their hometowns but their hometowns are urbanizing because more and more people are leaving agriculture and take jobs in manufacturing and services. Um, so here I have two pictures from Singer, which is a small town in uh, West Bengal on the east coast of um, India. So Singer is a good example of uh, in situ urbanization. It's a small town, but most people living in the town don't work uh, in the agriculture sector anymore. And a lot of them, local residents, uh, go to Calcutta, which is the nearby big city. It's about uh, 45 minutes away. So they go to Calcutta to work, to study. Um, so it's an urbanized small town. And Singer, the official status of Singer is a census town, which means for the census purpose, it's counted as urban. People living in Singer um, um, are counted as urban residents. But in terms of uh, governance, there is no municipal government. So it's basically a small city, but without a city government. Um, <clears throat> there's, <coughs> so there's, um, there's a number of village councils uh, in, in uh, India, they're called village panchayas. So these village councils um, somehow try to precariously manage local affairs. So that's a huge pro problem because across the country, there are many, many census towns uh, in India. And these are urbanized uh, small cities without city governments. And for the rural uh, village councils, they don't have the power to tax. And without tax, they don't have revenue to even provide very basic services, such as uh, street cleaning or garbage collection. And um, for the country as a whole, 
about 15% of India's urban population can be uh, is lives in the census towns, so cities without city governments. So that's uh, uh, one of the major challenges faced uh, by uh, um, uh, faced uh, by India. <clears throat> so that's a very uh, brief uh, background introduction on uh, um, the different urban trajectories of uh, the two countries. And for the book, uh, I'm mainly interested um, in uh, just one, <clears throat> one big question, which is what's the difference? How do these two countries, large complex countries differently govern their cities? And my main thesis is that, um, is this the territorial versus associational approaches to urban governance. For China, urban governance has a strong territorial logic. Um, by territorial, uh, what I mean is, if you look, look at how urban policies are made and implemented, they are pretty much, uh, they are strongly shaped by um, a very thick layer of local municipal institutions. Um, so in the book, I gave many examples of uh, what these <clears throat> local territorial institutions are. For example, uh, the hukou system, and also the system by which China promotes uh, local officials. And I have a couple of other examples. And for India, there's an absence of uh, similar local territorial institutions. And in general, municipal level institutions are very weak. So there's a vacuum at the local level, vacuum of power at the local level. And instead, instead of municipal institutions, <clears throat> we see a range of um, other actors that compete with each other and try to influence um, urban policies. So <clears throat> I call that arrangement associational, uh, associational approach to uh, urban governance. So basically, um, <clears throat> if we look at how policies are made and implemented in India, they are very fluid and also contingent on um, uh, coalition building between the state, the public sector, and also civil society groups. So that's um, how <clears throat> what I um, I mean by uh, associational. So <clears throat> I'm sorry about my throat. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so for the rest of uh, basically, I told uh, three stories. I used uh, three different examples to uh, illustrate the difference between the territorial and the associational approach to uh, urban governance. The first example is on housing and specifically on um, slum redevelopment uh, or redevelopment of informal settlements in Guangzhou and in Mumbai. And the second one is on land, land acquisition and disputes. The third example is on environmental governance, uh, specifically air pollution control in the two capital cities. So um, today, I'm, um, my husband just brought me a cup of water. <laughs> um, so today, um, I think I'm going to share with you two examples. Uh, the first one on housing, and then the third one on uh, air pollution control. And I want to leave um, a few minutes for Q and A. And if you have <coughs> questions on the second one, land disputes, I would be very happy to uh, answer <laughs> your questions. Um, so for housing, so here I compared urban villages in Guangzhou and uh, slums in Mumbai. And the focus of the comparison is the politics of compensation. So when these informal settlements get redeveloped, or in the case of Guangzhou, when they get demolished, who gets compensated and who doesn't? So that's the focus of uh, empirical focus of uh, my uh, comparison for this case study. Um, for Guangzhou's urban villages, the compensation pretty much depends on just three things. The first one is hukou. And the second one is land ownership, which is connected to uh, the rural hukou status. And the third one is 
probably the most interesting finding for me from uh, the field work, which is um, membership in uh, particular urban villages. So a lot of urban villages in South China are incorporated companies, shareholding companies. And many villagers are also shareholders. Uh, they hold different numbers of shares based on their age, their labor contribution to uh, their village. Uh, so every family member, every family, every household has a different number of shares. And the number of shares also um, um, uh, determines how much compensation uh, they can get when their uh, apartment buildings get demolished. So that's, um, I, I find that uh, pretty interesting. Um, and for and, and all three, uh, the rural hukou and uh, rural land ownership, and also the membership in specific urban villages, all of these are examples of local territorial institutions. And for Mumbai, the situation is very different. The um, uh, criteria for being eligible for compensation is uh, basically just one date, January 1st, 2000. If uh, the slum dwellers can prove with some paper uh, documents that they've lived in their community for the last 20 years since January 1st, 2000, then they are eligible for compensation. And if they can't prove, or if they haven't lived in their community continuously for 20 years, then they are not eligible. So it basically excludes most slum dwellers from getting compensated. Um, but the date is not um, 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 fixed. Uh, by fixed, not fixed, what I mean is it can be negotiated between residents and developers, and sometimes also with state bureaucracies. And in some slum redevelopment projects uh, in the Mumbai, actually the developers um, have helped local residents to fake paperwork to prove that uh, they are eligible. Uh, so people can take compensation and they can leave, and then they, the developers can uh, get the land and build high-rise luxury apartment towers. And you don't see China. Um, and the reason is um, it's pretty cheap uh, to uh, pay for the compensation in Mumbai. Even for the eligible families, every family only gets one 25 square meter um, apartment. It doesn't matter how much property they owned previously. It doesn't matter how many people they have in their family. So every family gets the same deal. Um, and it's pretty uh, cheap for the developers to um, uh, just pay people and then um, have them leave. So uh, so that's the difference um, between uh, Guangzhou's urban villages and Mumbai slums. Um, and for the uh, next example on the air pollution control in Beijing and Delhi, I think this is even a better uh, illustration of the difference between the territorial and the associational approach to uh, urban governance, in this case, environmental governance. Um, so both cities are um, pretty polluted, but in the last few years, Beijing has done so much better than Delhi uh, in trying to uh, um, uh, cut um, the pollution levels. So uh, let me start with Delhi first, uh, what Delhi has been doing. So basically, so here I looked at the trajectory of the city's clean air campaign over the last 40 years, from the 1980s to uh, close to 2020. I fin finished field work in 2018. So pretty much for the last 40 years, uh, the main actors in Delhi driving Delhi's uh, clean air campaign are environmental NGOs. Um, so it's civil society groups instead of the government. And their strategy has always been uh, trying to mobilize the Supreme Court uh, and also the central government and Delhi government um, and sometimes private industries. Um, by mobilizing these different actors, they try to, um, uh, the environmental NGOs try to meet their specific pollution reduction targets. Uh, that has been the pattern for the last 40 years. Um, 
only in the last, I would say, two and three years, the Delhi government has become slightly more um, active by uh, allocating a little bit funding to um, uh, uh, fat pollution and um, and sometimes before uh, elections, different political parties would say, okay, if we get elected, uh, we would uh, really fight pollution. But once they get elected, they do nothing. So, um, levels in Delhi, very high. I, it didn't go down that much uh, for the last few years. And by contrast, if we look at Beijing, uh, it's a very different approach. So basically, for doesn't it's not only Beijing, for all cities uh, in China. Their approach is, um, um, it's called, in English, it's target system. In Chinese, it's mobile so basically, um, the central government would set um, a time-bound pollution reduction target. And then that national target is disaggregated uh, by different provinces. And then every city, every district, even every town, township has their own time-bound air pollution reduction target. And if the target is not met, then the local officials uh, will be held responsible. Um, they don't get promoted or uh, in worst cases, uh, they get uh, demoted. Uh, so, um, so that's uh, the Chinese way of um, trying to uh, reduce pollution. And it's been uh, pretty effective in the short term, at least, if you look at the last five years um, or from 2013, 2020, most Chinese cities have um, have been pretty successful in uh, lowering the air pollution levels. And I call it territorial because, um, first of all, um, the target responsibility system they um, focus it focuses on individual administrative jurisdictions, the city of Beijing, uh, the city of uh, Shijiazhuang, so different. Um, 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 administrative units. And second, the enforcement um, is basically by holding the local territorial authorities responsible for meeting the target. So uh, that's why I use air pollution as an example of uh, the territorial way of um, um, improving uh, environmental quality. Uh, so that's about the air pollution case. Uh, and today uh, I'm going to share with you one example, not from the book, um, but something related to the pandemic, which is uh, the grid governance system. Uh, in Chinese, it's Wang Gehua Guanli. And I find this very interesting <laughs> um, because it's, um, I think it's an excellent example of China's territorial um, uh, logic of um, urban governance. And, and in this case, um, um, China's territorial approach to um, try to contain the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, I have uh, two images here. Uh, the picture on the left is a good colleague of mine, uh, Professor Li Zhigang at Wuhan University. He's the dean of uh, the School of Urban Planning at Wuhan University. And he sent me the picture in late April, uh, so last year, right after the lockdown of Wuhan was lifted in the middle of April. So, um, so it's a Sunday afternoon and he took his dog to campus and he told me that he was appointed as a grid manager, Wang Geyuan. And his job was to uh, stand on the street corner somewhere on the campus and tell people to keep their masks on. Uh, so it's April, it's still, the restrictions were still pretty strict. So that's what he did as uh, Wang Geyuan, great manager. And uh, the form, uh, he also texted me the form. Uh, so the form on the right is a list of uh, faculty members in the S School of Social Science at Wuhan University. So all of these faculty members, professors were appointed as Wang Geyuan. 
So on the form, uh, it has their personal phone numbers and also the boundary of um, um, the grid that uh, they were uh, in charge of, um, and also the number of households in each Wanggu. So I just find um, the system, grid governance system fascinating. I think it's one of the main, probably one of the most effective strategies um, China has used uh, to uh, control the pandemic, at least in the urban areas. And recently, I think Wanggu has been extended to uh, rural uh, areas as well. So, uh, and I see this as um, an example of um, uh, the significant tightening of territorial control um, and with the grid governance system, basically can uh, keep an eye on uh, every city, every street, every neighborhood, even every building, because for every residential building, there are different people appointed as grid managers, and they are responsible for contact tracing, quarantine, and other minor uh, tasks. So, um, so I'm using the example as um, use, using this as another example of uh, China's territorial way of uh, governing cities. Um, to come back to the to the book, um, so basically in the book I used three different case studies on housing, on land acquisition, and on air pollution control to demonstrate uh, the two different logics of urban governance in China and India. For China, um, I observe a strong territorial logic of urban governance because policymaking and implementation in cities is strongly shaped by uh, um, local territorial institutions and authorities. And for India, there's an absence of similar territorial institutions and authorities. And instead, policymaking and implementation is more fluid and contingent upon coalition building between the state, the private sector, and also civil society groups. So, uh, so that's the main thesis of the book. And uh, so uh, before we uh, um, shift to a discussion, I, I just want to maybe quickly mention things uh, to um, uh, maybe help <laughs> to facilitate the discussion a little bit. Um, so for the last few weeks, uh, maybe two months, I've given a couple of book talks and I get asked this question almost every time. <laughs> The question is, so how does my thesis, the territorial distinction, play to a more familiar ways of distinguishing governance in China and India? For example, democracy versus non-democracy. Um, the two countries, China and India, are compared um, all the time in the media, in the, um, academic research, and many, many people when they think about China and India, uh, they tend to uh, think, uh, focus on the regime types that China is not a democratic country and India is, and therefore things work very differently in the two countries. Um, and I don't dispute uh, the power of uh, political regimes. I think regimes, democracy versus non-democracy explain many, many variations. But also, um, I don't believe that regime types explain all the variations. Uh, these are two old civilizations and China became a communist only in the 1940s, 1949, and India became a modern democratic country uh, only to the 19. To, to the um, to the 1940s. So I don't um, think that regime types explain all the variations. So for this book project, basically uh, one of my motivations uh, was to uh, go beyond the regime type explanation and dig a little bit deeper and see what other significant differences in terms of urban governance uh, we can find for uh, these two countries. And I was interested in uh, demonstrating 
for example, how countries like China, a high capacity, non-democratic state actually operates at the municipal level. Um, and one of the most uh, interesting findings for me is this very unique territorial logic of uh, managing urban affairs. And for India, um, I was interested in um, finding examples to demonstrate how uh, countries like India, um, not high capacity, I would say medium capacity, uh, and very institutionally fragmented state. So how does, how do states like, like India actually operate at the ground level and manage urban affairs? And for India, my main insight is the associational way of uh, 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 making things happen, making policies and enforcing policies. So that's how um, I see my thesis relate to the territorial, uh, relate to uh, um, 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 uh, um, regime types. And uh, another question, um, so a lot of people have asked me, so, okay, so this is your this uh, territorial versus associ associational distinction. What about other countries beyond China and India? So uh, people have asked me about, um, trying to uh, apply on the thesis in the US, uh, Brazil, South Africa, and a range of other countries. So here's my thought. Um, I think China and India are two extremes when it comes to uh, the power of local governments. And uh, by local, I mean municipal governments, city governments. If uh, we look at, um, for example, spending expenditure, more than 60% of China's national expenditure is made by local governments. So that's a, um, that means local governments have a lot of power um, and also resources. And for India, the number is uh, less than 4%. Uh, less than 4% of the national expenditure is made by uh, local, by municipal governments. So that shows how weak uh, city governments in India are. So these two countries, um, two countries I picked to uh, compare are two extremes on the spectrum. And most other countries would be somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. Um, US, Brazil, South Africa, uh, the local spending is somewhere between 20 and 35% of the national total spending. And in terms of governance, uh, it's a hybrid, a mixture of both territorial and associational um, um, uh, ways of um, um, managing cities, managing urban affairs. So that's how um, I see uh, where China and India stand uh, in relation to uh, other countries in terms of uh, uh, the power of local institutions. Um, so I'm going to stop here um, and um, look forward to, uh, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Xuefei, for your wonderful talk. Um, we already have a large number of questions that have um, been inspired by your talk. And so I will start uh, with the first one. So, um, and this pertains to the earliest part of your talk. So Yu Yaosun <clears throat> asks, um, don't the people in small towns in India still go to other industrial cities to work? And so why would the small town be industrialized when people are already going to larger cities to work? Um, let me <laughs> read the question. Um, why don't the people in the small town, small towns in India still go to other industrial cities to work? Um, um, I think the question is um, probably related to uh, uh, in situ urbanization I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, uh, first of all, um, industrialization, or uh, more specifically, manufacturing, is not the main um, 
driver or factor for uh, urbanization. Uh, so that's a big difference from China. Uh, in India, it's the service sector. So when we talk about small towns getting uh, becoming urban, it doesn't mean uh, these small towns have a robust manufacturing sector. It means most local young people get jobs in the service sector, construction, transportation, um, light, um, uh, like small workshops. So um, uh, um, we can't, uh, I can't talk to, <laughs> we can't talk to the audience directly, but I think the question might also be related to migration. Um, I mentioned earlier that migration is not a main fact urban population increase in India. Actually, the answer is um, more complicated. Uh, India is a very big country. There's a lot of regional variations. For some states, migration is a leading, uh, a main factor uh, explaining urban population increase. But for the country as a whole, at least according to the statistics, <laughs> migration is not, and it is in situ urbanization that has been driving um, urban population growth. Great. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, so next question is by Yiming Wang, who says, thank you for the talk. And he has two questions. Uh, number one, is there any counterpart of the Beijing municipal government's campaign to clear, quote, the low class people, um, end quote, in India? And then the second question, is how Chinese central or local governments balance pollution control and the economic stagnation caused by it. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for, for, the, <laughs> for the questions. Um, is there any counterpart? Um, let me try to think of uh, similar examples. Um, I'm wondering if you could just step back for one second for the benefit of the rest of the audience to explain um, what that campaign is. Okay, yes, that, thank you for the suggestion. So um, so that campaign, uh, so a couple of years ago, um, the Beijing city government demolished, um, a, I don't know the number, probably, close to 20 uh, urban villages on the fringe uh, of uh, the city. And most of these urban villages are, or uh, were, <laughs> because they are gone. <laughs> most of these places were um, occupied by uh, migrant workers. So once the urban villages were demolished, uh, basically overnight, the migrant workers, migrant tenants lost uh, their uh, home, their apartment. So it's a way to um, uh, get rid of uh, low end population. Uh, that's the term uh, from the government, Di Duan Ren Kou. So that's the campaign. And another approach um, strategy <laughs> from uh, the Beijing city government was to uh, get rid of migrant schools. Um, so for uh, the official reasons are uh, like safety, uh, hazard for fire, whatever. So the city government has been systematically shutting down schools for migrant children. And uh, um, so they wanted to force the parents to take their children and then go back to their uh, hometowns in the countryside. Um, and Beijing is probably, um, um, uh, I'm sure this is happening in other cities as well, but um, the campaign in Beijing is uh, the best known case. Um, in India, um, I, I think we, um, there are many examples, but we should, um, I, uh, I don't know how, <laughs> if people in the audience are familiar with the Indian institution. <laughs> so the Indian institution, which is much more robust than the Chinese institution, uh, clearly, clearly forbids similar practices. Um, for example, uh, restricting people's movements by um, color or other uh, status. So I'm not aware of any specific policy or campaign from um, local governments to uh, try to get rid of uh, migrant workers uh, like what Beijing did. But if you look at how the migrant workers 
suffered last year uh, during the pandemic uh, is much, much worse than uh, the situation in China. Uh, so when Modi ordered the lockdown, it basically uh, gave people four hours to get prepared. And a lot of migrant workers got stuck. Uh, they were stuck in the cities and there they, they were worried that they would starve to death. Uh, they were running out of food. So many of them marched on foot to try to get back to their villages. And some were killed um, on their journey back home. So it's really a tr human tragedy. Uh, so uh, the answer is complicated. Um, there are no official campaigns, explicit campaigns uh, that um, similar to what Beijing did uh, to try to get rid of migrant workers. But that doesn't mean migrant workers in India are being taken care of very well by uh, the Indian central or um, different local governments. And the second question, how do um, Chinese authority balance environment and economic um, growth? Very good question. It's, it's tricky. Uh, basically, it's a cycle. Uh, when the economy is going well, then uh, the government uh, local officials um, feel more relaxed to uh, uh, use strict measures uh, to uh, try to improve <laughs> the environment. But when the economy is not going well, they are worried about the GDP, the, the numbers, so they, um, um, they focus on economic growth. Uh, so uh, I don't know if there's anybody who's done study like this, uh, for example, the relationship between economic cycles, ups and downs, and the environmental quality, for example, air, air pollution. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard balance, balancing act for local governments and especially for poor cities because they have more pressure. Uh, they can't just cut um, industrial jobs, manufacturing jobs to improve improve air quality. Um, they have um, many other things uh, to worry about. Thank you, uh, Yiming, for, for, for both questions. Great. So the next question is from Xu Xiaohong. Um, and he says, thank you for sharing your fascinating research. And um, says it's interesting that the pathway of in situ urbanization in India was what many Chinese intellectuals, including Fei Xiaotong, envisioned for China in the 1980s and early 1990s based on their projection of China's development of township and village enterprises. And yet, China ended up going in a very different direction. So why do you think that China didn't adopt this pathway of in situ urbanization? And is this related to the distinction between territorial and associate associational approaches of urban governance, urban governance. Hi, Xiaohong. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see you. <laughs> but thank you for the great question. Uh, you are absolutely right. So in the 1980s, China, the uh, urbanization in China in the 80s until the early 1990s, it's mostly driven by uh, in situ urbanization. And the Chinese term for that is Xiangzhen Qiye, so township and village enterprise, especially in the south, in the PRD, Pearl River Delta. But in the 1990s, early 1990s, the direction changed. And your question is what explains the change? I think it has to do with the central uh, leadership. Uh, if I don't know if everybody remembers. So Zhu Rongji was uh, um, um, in the central government and the early 1990s was the period when the central government decided to really build up Shanghai, uh, uh, especially Pudong. So uh, for cities, um, the focus changed uh, from small and medium sized cities to large cities and mega cities like Shanghai. And that trend of uh, investing in uh, large cities continued in the 1990s and also pretty much uh, 2000s. Um, so it even intensified uh, toward uh, uh, in, the, in the 2000s uh, because Beijing was 
getting ready for the Olympics and Shanghai was getting ready for the World Expo. Um, so um, for those two decades, 1990s and 2000s, investment, not only, um, not only money funding, but also policies. If you look at the policy, um, uh, favorable policies, uh, most the large cities um, really received special treatment from uh, the central government. Uh, so that explains, uh, there, I'm sure there are other reasons, but uh, the signal from the central government uh, explains why um, uh, in situ urbanization didn't um, 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 have much uh, impact for in, in the later decades, in the 90s and 2000s. Thank you for the question. Okay, great. So the next one um, is from uh, Yue Quan Guo, who says, thanks for the talk. Can you please elaborate on uh, three things? Um, and the first one is incidents or of conflict or protest um, in Mumbai during land acquisition and what claims Indian urban dwellers made and how those disputes might have been resolved and through what channels. And then there's a follow-up, but maybe start there. Okay, sure. Um, so the question is about examples of protests over um, over uh, land acquisition. Um, um, okay, I, uh, let me just clarify a little bit. Uh, so for the Mumbai example, at least <clears throat> for the case study I, I, I did for the book, uh, that's not about land acquisition uh, because the slum dwellers in Mumbai, they don't own land. So they are called encroachers by the state. Uh, so they are encroaching on uh, mostly public land. And there are different types of public land owned by central government, state governments, and uh, local municipal governments. So uh, the housing related protests um, are actually not about land acquisition. And instead they are um, uh, led by mostly housing rights NGOs to uh, help slum developers to stay put. So many slum residents, they don't want to leave. Uh, they want to stay where they are, but developers uh, want their land. So they want, developers want, want to get rid of uh, uh, the slums. Um, and um, so the protests are about the right to uh, stay put. Um, uh, the second part of the question is what claims do uh, the Indian uh, urban dwellers or slum dwellers make? Um, the, the, their claims, um, they, they believe they have a right uh, to be in the city. The city doesn't belong to uh, only to the middle class and the elite and uh, the, the, the big investors and developers. Uh, they believe they are citizens, uh, they have the right to vote and, and therefore uh, they should have, um, 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 uh, they, have, they have the right to stay there. Um, and how are these disputes resolved and through what channels? Um, it, there's no, it's, um, I don't want to generalize because even in Mumbai, it's case by case. Um, in many situations, the local uh, residents just get evicted, like what happened in China, in Shanghai, in the 1990s and early 2000s. They get nothing. Uh, they lose their dwellings and they are um, evicted. They have to find a, another spot in the city to uh, uh, to. to to live. And for the successful examples, uh, they, uh, if they can work with local NGOs, uh, they can get um, compensation, uh, which is not monetary. They get, a, it's called a rehabilitation unit, a small apartment somewhere on the periphery where there's no infra infrastructure, there are no jobs, there are no <laughs> schools, there's not even water. Um, so they get a free apartment in those rehabilitation uh, housing compounds. Um, and uh, so India is a democracy. Uh, so before 
every major election, politicians would promise slum dwellers uh, a lot of things, but most of those promises um, uh, never materialize. So there's a follow-up question related yes. to that, which is, are they and how are they held accountable? Okay. Uh, um, for the politicians, oh, okay. So the second question is on um, pollution. Um, if the politicians do not deliver, um, how are they uh, going to be held accountable by whom? Um, so, uh, yes, I th this is, um, I think this is a accountability question. It's an important question, not only for India and also for other um, countries. Um, uh, let me think of an example uh, from India first. Um, so for Delhi, the current ruling party uh, talks about air pollution control all the time. Uh, but uh, if you look at their action, uh, there's very little. But um, is the ruling party going to win the next election? Nobody can predict, but I think the likelihood is very high. Uh, it's a, you know, they have a lot of support. Um, so the question is, if they don't deliver, how come they can still be uh, elected next time? Uh, the short answer is, Air pollution is not a priority item for most political parties. Um, so there are other things to worry. Uh, um, for example, infrastructure, poverty, sanitation, uh, solid waste treatment. So at least for this example, air pollution, politicians or political parties don't deliver, but they can still get elected because uh, it's not a top uh, priority issue for uh, yet for, for the politicians. Um, should I read? Yeah, um, I think actually let's, let's go on um, because I think the third question is similar. Um, okay. So let's move on to uh, Yun Zhou's question who asks about the Wuhan example. And there was a related question earlier too that um, asks about, so first of all, the associational and territorial logic, um, is it also um, not just distinct from each other, but also within each other? I'm not sure I fully understand that part of the question, but um, so within the Wuhan example, that uh, within the territorial idea, the governance is still somewhat reliant on non-state stakeholders. So for instance, these professors. And the related question is, do these non-state stakeholders get something out of it? So for instance, do they get paid or when they're assigned to these duties, um, other than being accountable um, for fulfilling these duties since they aren't, that's not their normal job, what is it that they, their motivation to continue or not do this job? Okay, <clears throat> so let me maybe address the second part first. Um, the question is basically asking, so what if people say, no, no, I don't want to be a great manager. <laughs> Are there consequences? Um, so here, I really wish I could do some, ethnographic field work right now and interview some great managers of, from different places. So I can give you my guess. My guess is most great managers are Dangyuan party members. And there's even a term for that, Xia Chen Dangyuan, dive in party members. So basically these are party members who are asked by their work unit, their universities, their local courts, depending on what place they, they, they actually work. Um, they are asked by their workplace to um, volunteer as great managers in their own uh, neighborhood, in where they live. Oh, for the Wuhan example I showed, it's the campus, university campus, where they work. Um, and most people probably agree because there's a lot of pressure from their workplace uh, to, uh, to uh, um, uh, on them. Um, but I personally, I know um, 
um, well, two examples, my, some of my friends in the, in the North, they said no. <laughs> And one is um, a pregnant woman, and she just said, "No, I can't. I can't be a great manager. I'm expecting in a few months." I think if you have something, some practical reasons, you can refuse. But my sense is most people, um, if they can, then they, um, they 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 agree, then they they say they they do it. Um, and the first part of the question: Can both uh, coexist? I'm not sure if they you can find one in the other, but definitely we can find many examples uh, in China, examples of both territorial and associational approaches to uh, 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 um, governing cities or controlling the um, transmission of the virus. Um, and even for India, there are examples of um, territorial approaches to uh, um, uh, managing urban affairs, but my I guess my big point is, in both countries you can find both types of approaches, but um, for China the associational logic is so much weaker than the territorial logic. Uh, there are NGOs, there are uh, collaboration uh, collaborations between NGOs and the government and the private sector, but that's not the main um, mechanism that uh, shapes or uh, determines policies and enforcement. Um, for the grid uh, governance uh, system, if we use that as an example, it's uh, an order from, from the state, from, from the center to the province, to the cities, and then to, down to the neighborhoods. Um, so it has a clear territorial um, logic. Um, so okay. should we... Okay, I, th I think we need to um, end now. I very much um, appreciate uh, all of the questions and thank you so much, Dr. Ren, for joining us today and for sharing this important and interesting uh, comparative research. I just wanted to remind everybody that there will be the film uh, tomorrow night through the CHOP film series and that will be at seven o'clock p.m. with discussion afterwards. And uh, please join us for next week's talk. Thank you again. Thank you, Tyler. And, Thank you, everybody. And happy Chinese New Year for everybody. Um, if we don't see each other before then. Thank you.